This video is part two of my coverage of Abram Maslow's Transpersonal Psychology for PSY 230 Personality Theory. This has to be my absolute favorite part of Maslow's work, uh, just the fact that he uses words like grumbles and metagrumbles as theoretical constructs makes me happy. Um, Maslow talked about grumbles as responses, sort of a, a way of encapsulating the emotional uh, experience of being in a deficiency state with relationship to your basic physiological and psychological needs. So we grumble when we feel deprived or when we feel that, um, it, you know, think of when you're hungry, but you have no way of getting to food, how irritated you get. People talk about being hangry, for example. Um, that That's what he's referring to as a grumble. Or if you're lonely and that's upsetting to you, you can find yourself complaining about it, either you know online or just to yourself. Those are grumbles. Um, so we, we grumble when our basic physiological or psychological needs are in a deficiency state. The grumble is satisfied when um, those deficiency states are corrected. When I, I think about the word grumble, just to, to I love dictionaries, I have a thing for words. Um, I think it's helpful at this stage to kind of dig into what do we mean when we say the word grumble or what does Maslow, what did Maslow mean? So words like discontent, complain, um, or even <clears throat> uttering a growl uh, to rumble. So when you think about the origin of the word, what is Maslow trying to communicate here? When we are in a deficiency state, we kind of get we get rumbly, we, we complain about it to whoever will listen, even if it's just ourselves. So we, we complain, we are irritated. Think about the last time you were, say, stuck um, at an airport and your flight was delayed, you couldn't really do anything about it, and you were hungry, but you didn't have enough money to buy very much to eat. And what thoughts were going through your mind and they can get kind of growly and angry like how dare this airline put me in this position where I'm now in a deficiency state and I'm hungry and I'm tired and I can't get any rest and I can't get home grumble 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 you get the point um, meta grumbles in contrast um, to grumbles. Meta grumbles are when our growth is not proceeding in a way that we want it to. Grumbles are about basic needs that are currently deficient. So we may feel uncomfortable, we may feel angry, we may feel frustrated, um, but once that need is met by satisfying what's missing, by filling the deficiency, then we are not going to grumble anymore. When growth needs, meta needs are not being met, so these would be self-actualization needs, when those aren't being met, what we feel is restless. We feel maybe even bored. Um, so that restlessness, that boredom can also be interpreted as anxiety. It can be interpreted as um, sort of a, a growth-related sadness that you're just not you're not being all you can be. So the grumble takes a different form. It's not angry, frustrated um, grumbles. It's growth related frustration where you're saying to yourself, I can be more than this. I can be better than this. Why am I feeling restless? Because I'm not growing. It is kind of the way meta grumbles work. Now the next part of getting your head around what Maslow is talking about with the uh, hierarchy of needs, and, and really this is the essence of Maslow's motivational theory, is you have to make a distinction between what he called, because there, there are two basic tendencies in human personality functioning. There's a survival tendency 
that's associated with the the bottom four levels. Uh, although for a lot of us, we behave as if the Wi-Fi <laughs> is actually a survival related need. It's not, that's just a joke. Um, but we feel like it. If the Wi-Fi is out, it, it can almost induce panic in lots of people. So survival tendency, when you're talking about the basic physiological and psychological needs, uh, so things that you will do very poorly if they are you are deprived of them for very long. Um, on the physiological side, if you deprive people of food and water, shelter and warmth, they will not survive. If they, people are not safe, they may not survive. With the psychological needs, it may not seem quite as dire, but we know for a fact human beings do not do well when they are deprived of belonging and love and when they don't like themselves. So these are all things that are tied to our capacity to survive. And, you know, if you take a more Darwinian approach to it, if you don't have safety and physiological needs met and your basic psychological needs aren't being met either, from a purely Darwinian standpoint, you're less likely to reproduce. So Maslow even mentioned that these things, we have evolved as a species to have these basic survival tendencies built into our motivational structure because it supports our capacity to be successful as a species. Now from an individual psychological standpoint, the fact that we have evolved as a species with these survival needs and that they are prioritized kind of shapes how personality is later expressed um, and reinforces the importance of those middle two pieces of, of psychological experience. He described the survival tendency as, quote, merely motivated. And what he means by that is you feel when you're in a deprivation state for any of the four bottom levels of the pyramid, when you're in a deprivation state, you feel, based on the word, deprived. You feel a lack and you feel tension. What you're motivated to do is to reduce the tension that is connected directly to that, that deficiency state. So if you're hungry, you feel tension in your body, you feel the grumbling in your stomach, and you say, I really need to eat. And your motivation moves in the direction of getting food and making that tension go away. So it's seen as tension reduction motivation. And for, for Maslow, he's like, that's just simple survival motivation. He referred to these as D needs. So the, the bottom four levels, so self-esteem needs, belonging and love, safety and physiological needs, he referred to as deficiency needs or D needs. And they are based on the just the basic fact that we are biological organisms, but we are also social organisms, and we, we need to have these things or we simply don't do well. Um, and again, he assumes that you have to have these things at least under basic control before self-actualization is something that can be pursued. He argued that it's grumbling that happens when our frustration needs are, are when our um, basic needs are not being met and when they are producing basic um, frustrations. That frustration state that we grumble about either inside our own heads or to anyone who will listen. <laughs> I certainly see a lot of grumbling on social media. I feel like a lot of what people do on social media is grumble about things that they feel are interfering with their survival tendencies, especially belongingness, love and esteem needs. Um, but also there's, there's a whole lot of grumbling online about, you know, things that just, you know, slow you down and interfere with you getting along, getting, moving along through your day. Um, that's grumbling. Um, Maslow didn't believe that was particularly growth related. In fact, he said it was the kind of psychological experience that interferes with our capacity to self-actualize. So the, the more quickly and efficiently we are able to satisfy our basic survival-related needs in terms of physical and psychological 
uh, domains, the better positioned we are to move on to the actualizing tendency. So the actualizing tendency is just that very top lever layer of the pyramid in the hierarchy of needs um, is not deficiency related, it is growth related. So Maslow said there are there are deficiency psycho there's a deficiency psychology and then there's a being psychology. So you have deficiency needs or D needs that are associated with basic physiological and psychological survival needs. But then you have this whole capacity, and he really felt this was something to distinguish human beings from other kinds of animals. Um, we have the capacity, since we can mentally think about ourselves in the future, think about what we can do, think about what we can be, but we can also reflect into the past, what have we been, what have we done, um, what might we do in the future. Since we have that capacity for metacognition, we have the capacity to transform ourselves. And that's really the essence of being psychology. Um, he, he described the actualizing tendency as a push toward discovering, and this will sound a lot like Carl Rogers, discovering your inherent potentials, and he called this the actualizing tendency. So, you know, in contrast, you've got a survival tendency that really is only aroused and is only pushing our behavior when we are in a current deficiency state. The actualizing tendency is going to rise to the surface when those deficiency needs are quiet. And then we have time and we have the mental space to really engage in how can I grow kind of questions. He described it, this tendency as meta-motivated. Remember that he described the survival tendency as merely motivated. So the, the survival tendencies are basically motivated. Um, meta-motivation refers to moving the organism in a more complex direction. And, and that means, you know, you're not reducing tension. Yeah, you may be bored with yourself or feeling restless, but actually the resolution to being bored and restless is to what? It is to engage in some kind of excitement, exploration, challenge. It's pushing yourself into domains that are going to actually increase your level of tension, however temporarily. So you're intentionally making yourself uncomfortable. You're intentionally engaging in something exciting, something that you don't know yet, because that's what pushes you to grow in Maslow's model. He argued that these um, involve being or be needs that are connected to an inborn uh, motivational drive toward growth um, and expansion, which are, are words that he used to describe actualization. He believed that all human beings are born with the drive toward actualization. The major things that interfere with actualization are when our basic deficiency needs are not being met. Um, and, and we'll return to that idea here in a, a little bit. When we are experiencing the frustration of our actualizing tendency, he argued that that's when meta grumbles occur. Um, when our meta needs aren't being met, when we're not being challenged, when we're not being pushed, when we're not learning, we meta grumble. We may describe it as being bored, not being challenged, not feeling um, settled. Uh, being uncomfortable with the current status quo, and so on. So in other words, metamotivation is connected to um, values that are associated with becoming more than what we currently are. Um, now, some of this is culturally oriented. There is a strong tendency in Western culture to see human beings as needing to be explorers needing to be lifelong learners. Um, so there are some ways in which Maslow's theory fits that. 
Um, so, you know, thinking of meta motivation as being connected to the, the real need to grow um, it is important here. He argued that frustration of meta needs is can cause, you know, whereas frustration of, of D needs can kill you, um, you know, literally through starvation, uh, for example, or if lack of safety could lead you to be harmed physically, to even die. Frustration of meta, meta needs, though, may not kill you, but it can also make you unhappy because the meta pathologies, as he described them, um, can lead to the psychological experience of feeling a lack of, lack of meaning and feeling unfulfilled. So metapathologies, in contrast to basic pathologies, like if your psychological needs, your psychological survival needs aren't being met, you may feel the pathologies of anxiety and depression and loneliness, for example. If, however, you're not growing and you're experiencing a metapathology, you may be sitting back feeling unsatisfied, feeling a lack of meaning, feeling a lack of fulfillment, and that drives you to explore, to challenge, to move in the direction of greater um, complexity. So to, to connect the dots here, grumbles are, are things that are connected to deprivation uh, states for when your, your basic physical needs and your need for safety are being threatened or there are threats to your belonging needs and your esteem needs. They lead to basic pathologies. Metagrumbles, though, are really about bigger picture things. Um, so, you know, for example, people may be driven toward bigger values-based goals, seeking uh, perfection or justice or beauty or truth, for example. Um, but they can also be, you know, more broadly defined in less complicated terms of wanting to to be more, um, wanting to have an impact, wanting to exert change, um, and perhaps to be powerful. So when we're thinking about this difference between actualization and survival, remember the actualizing tendency is a pressure toward growth. And, and as I've put it, moving steadily in the direction of more complexity as opposed to less. Um, he, your authors describe it as this urge to enrich experience. Um, I see that as really challenging the self to, to become um, more nuanced, more experienced, more challenged. When we express the actualizing tendency, Maslow believed that, um, and you know, these are the words of your, your authors in your textbook, people become more complex, differentiated, and potent. And what that means is with complexity, when we grow and change, we develop more layers, more capacity to see ourselves in different and unique ways. We build skills, we build capacities, we build interests. So we become more differentiated. You learn new things about yourself that you didn't know before. You gain skills and abilities that you didn't have in the past. That affects your ability to affect change on your world and affect change on others. That's what your authors mean by potent, is being able to actually have um, efficacy. The survival tendency, just to drive home the point, is deprivation motivation. Uh, it's connected to D needs, um, where all you're trying to do is chase away the pain that is associated with their absence. So we have to work every day to make sure that our survival needs are being met, because if they're not, then we have, then we experience uncomfortable, maybe even painful frustration. So we, we have to constantly, because we are biological organisms, because we are psychological organisms, those needs are always on the table. They might be satisfied at 8 in the morning, 
but by four in the afternoon, you're hungry again, <laughs> right? So you're constantly having to monitor your survival tendency needs and keep them on an even keel. Um, with actualizing, the actualizing tendency, that tends to be a longer term game where you are really thinking about yourself as a growing, expanding organism um, over the long haul. So actualizing, the actualizing tendency tends to be a lifelong project, whereas the survival tendency is more moment to moment and day to day. Now I've mentioned in, in previous parts of this presentation how Maslow studied um, act, self-actualized people. He studied people um, who he thought were prime examples of people who have achieved this goal of being self-actualized. And so he selected people that that kind of fit what his impression was and he wanted to do an examination of what their traits and characteristics were. Um, no, this is not a scientific study. Um, it wasn't an experiment. He was going in with a set of um, assumptions and he made decisions about who he was going to look at as his uh, pool of individuals to profile. He, he had some rules that he was working with. He selected people he believed were, as your authors put it, relatively free of neurosis or major personal problems. Um, uh, from my reading of it, he, he set the bar fairly low <laughs> for that. Um, but And he also wanted to, in addition to that low bar that had to be crossed, these were people he saw as successful. People who were talented, had a lot of, of competencies, and they were using them in their world uh, to great effect. Um, he studied a fairly small group of people. Um, nine were people who were still living at the time he studied them, and nine were historical figures. Um, there was a tendency, if you look at who these 18 people were, um, he was following kind of the, the Western cultural model for what does a successful person look like. Um, so the bias was in the direction of people who were outgoing, who were extroverted, who are were successful by cultural standards of the time. And these tended to be highly educated and they were typically intellectual people. Um, those are limitations. So if you if you look at those 18 people, they're almost all of them are white and most of them are men. So you have to really kind of put that in in your thinking when you're thinking about how generalizable are these traits of self-actualized people according to Maslow. Um, they're not particularly general, generalizable. They are uh, based on an image of successful living that is very consistent with um, Northern European, uh, Western European, um, North American ideologies. Uh, and they do tend to be biased in the direction of masculine ideals. So kind of keep those in mind as we look at these traits. So the first category of traits, and there, there are a lot of them, but it may, it's helpful if you, you group them. So the first set of, of traits were under the heading of, of awareness, of what are people aware of when they are moving steadily in the direction of self-actualization. So awareness includes things like um, being able to quickly size up what's going on and being comfortable with that assessment being um, spontaneous and capable of looking at situations with a new eye. Um, he also felt that this awareness um, category included an openness to novel and very intense experiences. Um, remember how Carl Rogers in his description of the fully functioning person describes someone who's open to new experiences. Well, Maslow is kind of making that even bigger here to say that People are not only just open, they are capable of shifts of consciousness uh, that include these kind of mystical experiences that he called peak 
experiences. The next cat category is honesty. Um, he felt that people who are self-actualized um, conduct themselves with a kind of frank honesty. They know themselves and they size up other people and they tend to conduct themselves in a way that is authentic. So what's included here? He, he believed that this, this concept of, of being honest is being able to feel connected to others, uh, so feelings of kinship, and being able to be honest about that, you know, seeing um, a, a person identifying who they are and what they're like and saying, yes, I have that same experience. He, he also felt that people in this zone of living authentically are able to have deeper, uh, more meaningful relationships with friends, with intimates, um, and so on. He, he also associated with these self-actualized people, and again, this shows his Western cultural bias. He, he felt that these were people who valued democratic ideas. They value other people's opinions. They take those opinions into consideration when making their own choices. They value participation in decision-making with others. Um, and then, you know, when he, he, he drilled down into this this broader concept of living authentically, he found that these people, these 18 people that he studied, tended to be described by others as having a philosophical approach and also a sense of humor about the absurdity of just life and how weird and, and unpredictable life can be. So when he says unhostile sense of humor, he means humor that's not used at the expense of other people but instead it's just humor associated with the weird, stupid things that happen in our everyday lives. The next category of traits can be housed under the heading of freedom. Um, remember how Rogers talked about experiential freedom? Um, Maslow has a similar construct here where he described these self-actualized people as being um, kind of organic in their experiences. They're spontaneous, they're described as, you know, just natural, their their actions tend to flow from their, directly from their interactions with the world. Um, he felt that people experiencing this kind of um, freedom were, were able to detach. And he, he described these 18 people as, for the most part, they were able to take themselves out of their social engagements and enjoy and, in fact, benefit from being alone. So part of the idea of freedom for Maslow was people being able to say, I need thinking time, I need alone time, I need processing time. Um, and that kind of feeds into the idea that he really valued and saw in these 18 self-actualized people. These were people who were capable of great deal, a great deal of independence. Um, while they were capable of deep connections to friends and intimate partners, they were also capable of standing on their own with autonomy. Now, again, that shows a Western cultural bias. Um, and also a masculine bias in his theory. He also saw uh, an outgrowth of freedom as being connected directly to creativity. Um, and again, that, that echoes what Carl Rogers said about fully functioning people, that they tend to be creative. The next domain is in the domain of trust. Um, and it's trust of self and trust of others. So when he talks about acceptance, he's saying that um, these were people who accepted their own flaws, their own capacities, their own talents, their own worth, um, and they accept that in others, as well as in the world, that the world is never going to be perfect, and the world is often going to offer you a whole boatload of crap. Um, can, can we mention the pandemic? the world offers us crap. It's not the world's fault. It just happens, right? So he's talking about that kind of faith in the, in the nature of the way life unfolds. 
um, when he's using the word trust as an umbrella here. He also felt that people tended to be um, trusting in their own capacity to solve problems. So by saying problem centering, um, what he thought these people tended to do was in, instead of brooding and complaining and blaming when challenges arose, they tended to lean into the problems and explore creatively solutions for them. And that's what's intended here by problem centering. And then finally, um, he found that these were people who trusted themselves. They trusted their own organism, to use the Rogerian term. Um, when your authors say resistant to enculturation, what they're referring to is um, a resistance to being forced into the mold that the current social fads are pushing. Um, so if you, you think of people like Eleanor Roosevelt, she was rarely concerned with what other people thought of how she looked or, or how she conducted herself. She was resistant to being fully uh, enculturated by other people's demands of who she was. This allows people to trust themselves, to be themselves, regardless of their context. And that concludes uh, part two of my coverage of Maslow's transpersonal psychology.